Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome back to BFW 2401, week nine, uh, part two. Now, in part one, we just introduced the, uh, we introduced the framework of uh, what we call uh, market risk. Uh, we, have, we can have so many asset classes and, and, uh, uh, and our banking uh, trading book, uh, we can have fixed income securities, we can have uh, equities, we can have foreign exchange, we can have derivatives and commodities, as I told you. Uh, but we are limiting this uh, for the sake of time and for the sake of this, the nature of this class, we are limiting it to uh, only fixed income, uh, foreign exchange and equities. Now, in part one, we discussed the framework of this market risk, the equation, the risk matrix, and this, uh, that was the first part. Now, in the second part, we will actually run the calculations and see how does it work. So uh, having said that, if you allow me to share my screen, and uh, this is actually what I'm going to do. And since I am um, going to, uh, so this is actually um, what we are doing. Uh, this is bar two, and we are doing the models and the calculation. And uh, so the risk matrix, remember what we are going to do now is actually the, is actually the risk matrix uh, model. Uh, if you allow me just to, because I need to write something here. So remember what we are going to do today is the following. So we are trying to calculate the market risk. Now the market risk, we have to follow what we call the risk matrix. And the risk matrix is, we can have it for so many, uh, um, we can have it for so many um, asset class. So the risk matrix, but we are limiting it today to uh, fixed income, foreign exchange and equities. And the process like this. So the process will, if you want to reach first, to calculate the uh, risk for the uh, all those items in the trading book, first you will calculate fixed income, and you will create something called the DIR for fixed income, which is daily earning at risk. And number two, we will do it for the foreign exchange, and you will calculate its DIR. Now we will calculate then later on the equities and we'll have a DIR also and we'll combine all of those in what we we'll call the risk matrix. Now remember the risk, the risk matrix is actually the DIR of the aggregate, the aggregate DIR of all those three. But what do we mean by aggregate DIR? It means one day. Now, if you want to calculate it for more than one day, more than one day, then we will introduce ourselves to something called the value at risk. And the value at risk, you can choose the days. You can have uh, whatever, uh, five days, 10 days, now the VAR calculation, just for your information in this stage, the VAR is actually the DIR times number of days. You want, you want it, it's the VAR is actually the DIR number, times the number of days. You can have it for five days, 10 days, whatever. So this is the whole thing we are trying actually to do today. And let me now start with the, uh, let me now start, if you allow me, please, with the fixed income. Now, this is the fixed income. And when we are trying, when we are talking actually about the fixed income, so the market risk is the estimated potential loss under adverse circumstances, which means we will have to use what we call, this is a market risk, which is a very random, so we have to use a distributions distributions. And when we, when we have to use 
the normal distributions, we have to have a confidence level. That confidence level can be 90%. So when we report, we report with this confidence or 99%. And we will see what type of um, um, confidence we will use. In, another, in other words, what we are going to do is that there is actually the market risk exposure over the 24 hours. So we will have to see if this is the normal distribution of the item we are trying to investigate, then the normal distribution will have here a mean, and then here we have plus and minus, and we have to calculate. If we are talking about 90% for this area, if this area is 90%, percent, which means we accept this to be 5% one tail and we accept this to be 5%. And I will tell you how we are going to use this when we use it for the uh, fixed income securities. Now, if we assume 90% confidence at the time, the, the disturbance will be within 0.65. And I will show you why. Uh, so we have Z values and we have uh, 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 what we call uh, um, standard deviation, and we have also the confidence level. So if we have 90%, that means we are talking from this area, this, this is the area where, uh, where the distribution will be. And actually, if it is, if we are calculating for one day, so we are calculating Either this area depends whether we want it by plus or minus, and I will show you uh, which we will be used as plus and minus. Now, before I go to the, the distribution, uh, this, is, um, this is just uh, an example from the industry, which is the SP500. And this is the distribution of the return, which we actually will use. Now, the distribution of the return in finance, just to understand that, what, what does it, what do, what do we mean by the return? So it's the price of today minus the price of yesterday over the price of yesterday. So this is actually, it will be the change in percentages. This change can be, as you can see, plus, or minus on the return. And this is daily basis. So this is, they take it from, um, see, uh, well, this is a distribution and this is the percentage of return. As you can see, the percentage of return, this is the change in R and the return. And you can see it, it's from minus 0 0.6 to minus 0. Uh, to plus uh, six, and this is actually the um, uh, uh, the normal distribution predictions, and this is the values, and you can see the thing why we are bringing this because we are looking at the mean, and in finance the mean, if there is a normal distribution, the mean should be zero. The mean of what? The mean of the return. because this could be plus minus. So if you have a price going like this, and this is time, and this is the return, uh, this is the price, for example. So you are taking the price of this day, from this day, and then you continue like this. They say if this continues, we will expect end of the day, there's to be a return of uh, the mean to be zero. Uh, this is what they are trying to tell us here. Now we are expecting it to go up, it can go down, it can go straight, whatever. So when we talk about fixed income, having taken this consideration, um, this is just to tell you here, for example, the confidence level 90%, and this is actually um, equals to one standard deviation 
to standard deviation, three standard deviation, or sometimes I can give you the standard deviation uh, itself. But this is when it comes to the normal distribution. So this area, as I told you, we are talking about return. This is minus, and this is plus. So this area is actually, when we calculate this, we can calculate it as the mean plus or minus the Z standard deviation. Now here, as you can see, this is the plus side, which means mean plus Z value times the standard deviation. And this is mean minus Z value standard deviation. Now, as you can see, the Z value is 165, 196, depends on the confidence level. So if we know this, this is just one thing I want you to know because I will, I will, I will take you now to the next step. Which area we will use when we talk about fixed income? Are we worried about this area or worried about this area? Now, when we are talking about fixed income, actually we are worrying about the plus. And somebody would say, why we should worry about the plus? Because I'm holding a fixed income. A fixed income means a fixed income security, means a bond. This bond could be corporate, um, uh, corporate bond or treasury bond or treasuries. And the price of those ones is actually the cash flow over one plus the yield. Now, if the yield increases, the price will go down. My concern is the price that will go down. So I'm concerned about the I if it increases, not increases, because this is a distribution of the yield, of the return. It's not the distribution of the price, of the yield. So in this case, I am, if it is a distribution of the yield, I am expecting the mean to be zero, if it is normally distributed, as I show it here for the uh, S&P 500. And therefore I'm concerned about this area. So if we are talking about uh, Z value of 90%, so the 90% confidence equals Z value of 1.65. So in this case, I need to know the standard deviation. Look at this example. So we have a seven year coupon bond and we define bad yield change as that there is a 5% chance of yield change being exceeded in either directions. And we are concerned about this direction, of course. Assuming normality of 90% of this of the time, uh, yield change will, will be with N 1.65, which is 1.65 to the right, to the left, or 1.65 to the uh, left. Now this 1.65, because this mean equals now zero because plus the Z 0.65, I just know, want to know the uh, uh, normal distribution and that's it. So in this case, if you let me how much, see how much the, so then if the center deviation is 10 basis points, so in this case, I can calculate this area as a probability. So it's actually, it will be 1.65 times 10 basis point, which is actually, it will be 16.5 uh, basis point. So this will be actually 16. So this will be, as I told you, it's the mean plus Z value times the standard deviation, which is this area. Now we understand the mean is zero because it's normally distribution and the Z 1.65 and the standard deviation is 10 basis point. This will make it 16.5 16 point, 16 point basis point. That's, that's all, all you need now to do uh, this is the actually the uh, the changes in one day. You have to multiply it only by you have to take this one 
and then you have to take the what we call uh, uh, modified uh, duration and then calculate it by the exposure. The formula is there, uh, the, the, but this is the technical point. Now let's take this example. Assume the yield change are normally distributed. We understand like this, which means this one is zero. Okay, a 90% area under the 65, which means we are talking about this area and this area. Of course, as you know now, we are all concerned about this area, which is the right one, not the left. Okay, um, if last year the mean change daily will be z was zero, and actually we should know, know it, if it is a return, it will be zero. Now, whether, well, the standard deviation is 10 basis point, thus the change is 0.65. So the daily yield on the uh, on the um, uh, on this will have fluctuated more than 0.65 of the time. So uh, this is if it fluctuates more than 0.65 basis points. Okay. So the adverse move in the yield are those I'm talking about. I'm reporting about 95 confidence, 95 percent confidence, which is the move from here to here. So um, the adverse moves in the yield are those uh, that decrease the value of the security. So if the yield increases, we know the price will go down. So occurrence is 5% of the time, which means one day over 20 days. One over 20 days, which means 5%. This is you, when you, when you report, you expect that uh, uh, that we will go be, beyond this area in one day over, uh, uh, you know, uh, 20 days. So uh, if it occurs uh, more than the 0.65, more than this area, more than this area, it will occur uh, here which is one day in 20 days. Okay, now let's talk, you know, look at the example extensively. So you have to calculate what we call, so the DIR for fixed income is actually daily price volatility times the exposure, which means the dollar exposure, how much I'm investing, which is how much dollars I have investing in income and this and the securities. The problem is the daily now, the daily price volatility, to calculate it, you have to go to this, you have to get minus modified duration times the adverse move, which is the adverse move. I could take you back to the distribution. If this is 5%, if this is 5%, the adverse move is from here to here which is, as I told you, the Z value, this is 90%. The adverse moves means we are worried if the uh, yield will be increased, so the price will go down. So in this case, this is actually zero. This is 1.60, this is the standard, this area is the Z value, the mean, as I told you, time this last the Z value times the standard deviation. So as you can see, this is the price volatility. So the adverse move, the, if you have here, let's just calculate it. So we have uh, duration of seven years. Face value is this one. The yield in the bond is seven to four, 3%. 
And the adverse change in yield is 0.65, which is this one already calculated, 16.5 basis point, which is this amount, okay? Now, all I have to calculate is the, uh, what you call uh, modified duration. Now, modified duration, formula is actually duration over one plus R. Let's see what is the, so the duration is, as you can see, is seven over one plus the yield, which is this one. Plus the adverse move times the adverse move which is actually this one. Now I can calculate this to be 6.5 to 7. Now I already calculate now the uh, durations times, and now I'm in position actually to uh, calculate the, uh, the DIR. So the daily price uh, volatility is this one. And now I can calculate the DIR, which is I only need to, to calculate the DIR is to take the market value of the position times the price volatility. This is the price volatility, which I calculated to be, as you can see here, one oh seven seven percent this number. All of this, this number now, I just multiply it by the position. So I multiply the position by this one and I get 10,770, which means this 1 million, bring it which my investment in one day, it can go down by 10,770. So you are talking now about uh, uh, the rest, which is your, your investment now in one day can drop to um, 989, 330. If you take this, if you take the 1 million, if you take 1 million minus 10,770, I think there'll be 989, 330. Uh, this is uh, the, your risk. Now we finished with the DIR. As I told you, we can calculate the DIR but then we want to calculate the VAR. The VAR is actually, it depends on how many days. As I told you, we can calculate here. We can calculate, so the, the DIR is actually, now it's, a, it's the DIR times the um, under square, the under the number of day, the under number of days under the square root, which is five days. Now we'll find in five days, we can drop 24, 8,000, which is this one million. In five days, it can be minus by 24, zero, eight. Two, this is my drop in, in, in one day. So I expect, uh, I expect maybe my, to drop to, we just calculated, so. So this could be 975, so my assets can go down to nine seven eight two one eighty 
in five days. In one day, it will be dropped to this amount. In five days, it will be dropped to this amount. I think this is the most difficult. It's not the most technical part in this, in this, in this wheel, in this calculation. The rest are just very easy. Now let's move to the next asset class, which is the foreign exchange. Just, just to to remind you, when we when we calculate the uh, the the deal, we have to go through. We have to calculate the price volatility. We have first to calculate the adverse. And the adverse, as I told you, this area. And then we have to calculate the modified duration. Then we have to multiply, multiply both of them to get the daily price volatility. Then we multiply the daily price volatility by my exposure, which means my investment in this class, to get the deer for one day. And if I want to get it for more than one day, I multiply it by the number of days I choose. It can be 10 days, 15 days, whatever under the square root. This is the square root. So this is the square root. Okay. Now let's go to the foreign exchange. In the case of foreign exchange, DIR is computed in the same way as an interest rate risk. We just do the fixed position, time did change at the standard deviation. Now, um, as an interest rate risk, which we just see the changes in the interest rate risk. So look at this example, this bank, which it looks like uh, um, Australian bank, they have this investment, they have 20 million, their currency, currency is Australian dollar, right, OZ. So they have 20 million in Euro and they have 20 million in British pounds. And they are subject to market risk because the exchange rates between the Australian dollar and those currencies can change. Now they see the volatility of the exchange rate of the dollar to the um, to the euro, uh, the price is this one first, the exchange rate, and the standard deviation from the history for the for both of them is actually sixty five basis point and forty basis point, respectively. So they want actually to calculate the var, not the dir which means we have to get the deal first uh, using 90% confidence. So we understand that the uh, foreign exchange position uh, is for this is for the Euro times its exchange rate. So actually I have $8 million um, Australian dollars. And then I have the British pound, I have 20 million and the rate is 128. So I have actually 32 million. Now the volatility for the volatility is actually like this, as I told you, the volatility, you are dropping the exchange rate, the drop of the exchange rate actually, which is the, you are taking the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is, um, you are taking 1.65, if this is the increase and this is the decrease in the exchange rate or the value of the dollar. So it will be 1.65. This is the drop times the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is 65%. This is for the um, Euro. This is for the uh, bounds and you find this to be this is the volatility. You need now to, to time it, time the exposure to get the, uh, the deal. And this is actually uh, 74.25 basis point. So now the deal is the value position times the price volatility. This is the price volatility. For the bound, this is the price volatility for the Euro. So I get this 80, 8 million, which is from here. 32 million from here times the volatility of the Euro and the uh, British pound. And I find it to be 85,800, which means if my investment was 8 million, I expect one day drop of the worst situation, huh?
and this I expected to be, we have here 32 million. This is 5 million. This is OZ, okay. Australian dollar. This is times, and this is 32 million minus, this is 32 million minus, this is what I expect. And you can calculate actually how much is this. So if you calculate, this actually expected to be 791. Seven million nine fourteen, and this can can be dropped from two hundred to thirty two million to thirty one million thirty one million seven six two and six hundred. So that's all, you know. Um, you wanted the VAR, now the VAR, as you know, this is the DIRS. This is the drop in one day. You wanted the drop for, if you want the drop for five days, for 10 days, just multiply, well, just multiply the DIR, which is actually the 85, 800 times 10 days. Uh, or 237, this is the bar. As you can see, this is the bar. This is the bar. For the Euro, this is for the, uh, uh, this is for the Euro, and this is for the British pound. So it's 237, 600 times 10 days. And of course you find this and this amount. So we are done with this one. Now go to equities. Now equities is the same thing. You have the position and you need also 90% confidence. As I told you, so the volatility of the price, you expect this to go down so you will get 1.65 times the standard deviation. How much the standard deviation? Volatility is 0.22, which means you get 33,000. This is the deer in one day. This is the deer in one day, which is 33,000. Okay, out of the uh, 1 million, which means this 1 million can be dropped to nine hundred sixty seven. Okay, nine hundred sixty seven thousand. So we are done with this one. Uh, actually, we are done. Now we go to the risk, risk matrix, which is the aggregation. As I told you, we have to calculate the DIR for all the classes. And then we take all these DIRs and find that and calculate the DIR for the whole thing. So assuming now you have three, if you have seven years coupon, if the drop of the equity is 1077, and I assume that the changes and the um, currency is 9320, and this is 33,000. And as I told you, the dollar, the, the deer should be a dollar value. So if you add them all, you can find 5390. But the problem is when we calculate this, we don't do that. We have to get a matrix, the risk matrix. And the risk matrix is coming like this. It's the, it's the standard deviation. So the variance, you have to get the variance for the first one, you have to get the variance square 
This is for the fixed income. And then for the currencies, and then you get the correlation between the currency A and B, currency, this is the correlation between the fixed income and the foreign exchange risk, which is almost 20%. Then um, you take the correlation between the foreign currency The, the fixed income and the equities, which is 4%. So we take A and C, and then you take the correlation between the uh, foreign currencies and the equities, which is actually this amount. And then you distribute, you take all of those and you take them, you, um, you get the, because this is actually, uh, you want to get the standard deviation. So this is the variance. You want to get the standard deviation, which is, um, so as you can see here, it's 1077 plus square 9320 square 33,000 square, then the correlation between the fixed income and the foreign exchange times their values, then the, for the correlation times the values of the foreign exchange, the uh, fixed income times the equity, and then the correlation two times the uh, correlation between the foreign exchange and the equities. And you find this to be 39.69. This formula will be given to you. This is the risk matrix. And the risk matrix is actually calculating the aggregate deal using this, this formula. So it's aggregate deal. Now, if this is aggregate deal, how much is it? 39. And why it is? Because if you add them up all, if you add the 10.77, as I told you, and the 9320 and the 33,000, you will find this to be 53. So we cannot do that. There is overlapping between the risks. So, and the overlapping is, as you see here, 20%, and here is 40% between the fixed income and the, for the equities, and it is 10% between the foreign exchange and the equities. So actually, because of that, this amount will be decreased to this amount, which is this amount is becoming now this amount. It dropped, you cannot add them up. Now, this is the whole thing about the risk matrix. Let's go now to uh, um, the weaknesses of this risk matrix. See, we have only here three assets and see how big is this risk matrix. What if you have, you have here say one, two, three, and you continue. We have stocks, so many foreign exchange. So we are talking about 1000 in your portfolio. If you have 1000, for example, assets in your portfolio. So you need to get the correlation between each one and the other one. This will be just a mess, you can, it's crazy. And this is one problem. The problem is to get the correlation because when you get the correlation, you have to go, for example, if you take the correlation of SimeDB and another company, say any um, 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 on Sunway, for example, uh, of their stocks. So you have to go for from day one to maybe you take 3,600 days, 2,500 days, maybe, you know, that is 10, 10 years to see the correlation among them. Now, according to the correlation, you will find the mean of this correlation. It's only one day. So 
Now you, you if this is for example, Sam Derby and this is the Sunway. And this is continue for 250, 2,500 days. Then in this case, um, you can get the mean here. The mean is actually the correlation between the two securities. I told you if you uh, have 900 securities, which is the listed in, you know, call on board stake exchange. And then you have all those type of currencies and you have all those type of bonds and derivatives and you need to get all these correlations. This is becoming very, very difficult. Yes, we have what we call robots who can do these things for us, but actually it's, it's, it's mess even when you calculate, you have to be accurate about those issues. So they say we have to move. So the risk matrix is actually, they say it's tedious because calculating this is very difficult and it's very uh, complicated. Uh, and you have to estimate the standard deviation of each individual security first, and then estimate the correlation matrix of the securities, which means you have to calculate the standard deviation to calculate the deal of each one. And then you have to calculate also the correlations of those, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, those, of those securities. So as you can see now, um, they move to something called historic or back simulation. Now historic or back simulation, you don't have to worry a lot about this. Uh, our first, not, you have, in, in our calculation, we always assume the normal distribution. Our prediction is based on the normal distribution. Which we see, we think all this is normal distributions, whether we are talking about the fixed income, whether we are talking about the, um, the yield of the fixed income as we see it, uh, when we calculate the fixed income or we calculate on the foreign exchange price or in the equity prices. Always we expect, you know, uh, a zero, uh, a normal distribution, which means very symmetric. This equals this, and this is zero. Now, this could not be the situation this could not be the situation. So if we violate this, which means this is, it cannot, we cannot calculate the deal. The other thing, the correlation is making a problem, as I told you, and calculation the returns. So uh, calculating the standard deviations and the correlation. So what we do now is we go to the historic. Now the historic is actually, it looks like this. So now this is an example of foreign exchange. You can have it about anything. If I have, for example, uh, this is my investment in foreign exchange. This is Japanese yen, and this is actually Swiss franc. Now the price of the Japanese yen to the Australian dollar is 100 to one, which is 500. Now on this one is 101 for the, of, of today, which is 18,181. Now, we assume what we call uh, the, we, we study the sensitivity. And the sensitivity means you increase the, you, you, um, you expect a drop on your investment by 1%, which means we expect the Japanese yen to be weaker, which means increase by 1%, which means from 100 to one OZ, It becomes now 101, which means my OZ is now equals one OZ, Australian dollar. This is Japanese yen. Now the Japanese yen can be 101 to the only one dollar uh, equals one, which means now the Japanese yen is weaker, which means my investment now is less. How much less? This is what I lost in 1%. Instead of being 5 million, now it's only 495, which is, uh, this is a drop. If the Japanese uh, yen was depreciated. If this Swiss franc was depreciated by 1%, this is 18.81. This we called it the delta. I want you to understand it. It's, 
the understandable delta is a drop of 1%. Hypothetically, you, you assume that there will be a drop of 1%. And if there is a drop of 1%, that is actually, uh, in this case, it's, a, it's an increase uh, uh, you know, a depreciation in the Japanese yen and here a depreciation in the Swiss franc. So that will cause me, if there is 1% depreciation, that will cause me 49,505 in my investment in the Japanese yen and 18,010 in the uh, uh, Swiss franc. Now what I do is I go two years back, which is 500 days, right? I go 500 days back. So if this is, for example, this is my calculation here is on the 1st of September, 2019, or say it's 2020, okay? Um, I can go back, which means the next day is the 30th of November, then 29th of November, then 20, and then I keep doing this, okay? And see the actual change. So the actual change, for example, here was five basis points, 50 basis points, and here 20 basis points. Then I just calculate, multiply this by this one. So it's 50 basis points or 50% times the 1%. So actually this is my drop and this is my drop, this is actual drop. And they continue, it can increase or decrease. I get, this can be plus or minus. You agree? Because the, the fluctuation of the of currency can go up or down. I just see whether it is a drop of uh, uh, what we call 5% or an increase of 5%. And if this is continuing, then in this case, um, I, will, I will have now 500 days. So I will have 500 days with these values. So I can have here, this is first day, then second day, third day, I will have a value here, a value here, a value here, continue to 500 days. Then just, you know, list them, which is sort them from the highest to the lowest. And you will take the worst 5%. So the worst, which means you will take the least amount the minus, the biggest five. So when you list them from the uh, from the highest to the lowest, those minus values will come at the end, and the largest of the minus values will come at the end. You take the last twenty-five observations, because it's five hundred days times five percent. It's actually twenty-five days. When you list all those days, you take the worst. 25 days. It's easy. That is your bar of 5%. Finish. This is what you do. Say what we did here is actually one day. Then you will calculate the bar for second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, and you continue like this. And then you actually, you, you take the worst five, uh, uh, the, the worst, uh, what we call, uh, 25 days. This is how we do it. So this, uh, there is a weaknesses here. See, we take the, we rank this from worst to best, and then we take the worst 25 days out of the 500. This is what I told you. It comes like 25, the last 25 observations. There is a dis disadvantage for this because it's 500 observation is not very um, many from SESCAP standpoints. So they want to increase this 500. They say, maybe it's not enough. Maybe they need 10,000 days. So when we have 10,000 days or 10,000 observation, you will still do the same. You will still do the same because the system will do, the, do it for you. We go to the uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Now Monte Carlo simulation is actually Exactly like the um, uh, his, um, uh, the what we call the uh, uh, historic simulation. Um, the, the difference is just I use the you know uh, the the system to generate for me 
500 days and they have 10,000 observations. Of course, they take, they can calculate the simulation, the system will do it. Even, you know, Axel can do it for you. You calculate the historical variance, covariance matrix. Then they do composite the matrix into two matrices. This is all math. How do they do it? But the system will do it for you. Then you calculate the bar, as I told you. When you calculate, when you have 10,000 days, again, 5%, you take the worst 25. Uh, well, 45%, which is the worst 500 days. You add them up. This is your bar. Okay. Here you add the 500 days, 25 days, and you add them up, it's your bar. Here you add the 500 days, it's your bar. Uh, we are done now with this one. Now let's go to regulatory models. Regulatory models, actually I'm not, I have no intention to test unit because we will discuss it when we go to week 11, which is the, um, the market risk calculation for the uh, um, capital risk which is the capital adequacy and that was in week 11. So this part which we are going to study now is related to that part. So I don't want to test you in this one and it will not be included in the next test for this one, but just for the sake of information, uh, we have to calculate, see, we have to calculate the risk for fixed income and for equities and for foreign exchange. So for the foreign exchange, um, they have standardized model requires calculation of net exposure. So you have to, the net exposure to be converted into dollars at current spot exchange rate. So if we have uh, 10 million, for example, exposure in one of those, so you have to um, get the next exposure and then you have to calculate it according to the current exchange rate. For example, if it is Japanese yen, to the Australian dollar. This is the exchange rate to see how much you have. And then the capital requirements equal to 10.5% of the total long position on the foreign position. So actually it's 10.5% of this, of, uh, of the long position. See, remember we are talking about now capital adequacy of the total long position of the financial institutions. So what we mean by the, the long position, which means your inventory of the, uh, this is actually, you have to multiply it by 10, this amount, whatever it is in dollars, then you multiply it by 10.5%. This is your capital risk. It's very straightforward. Now for equities, you have to take 4% for the uh, systematic risk and systematic. And you have to take also 4% from the position. So if you have investment for 10 million again in equities, you have to take 4% uh, for the systematic, which is the market and systematic, which is the, the firm specific. And then 4% for the, this is the in systematic and this is the systematic. We are only care, about, we care only about, um, so the 10 position here. And you take, you have to take 4% and 4% actually. And this is actually will be your risk. So they expect the, um, you know, fluctuation to be, uh, you have to take 4% uh, uh, gross position in the equity. And this is 4% for the gross position equity. It's almost 8% for both. Okay. Uh, and calculating the DIR, uh, adverse change and rate as 99%. We can also use what we call uh, distributions. And we are calculating, uh, calculating, taking distributions. We have to take 99% that rather than uh, 95%. Uh, This is for the internal models, internal models. So this is, and I don't know I, whether I should explain all of this, but in, in DIS, we have what we call standard model, standard approach, 
when we calculate the capital risk. Remember now, when we talk about regulations, they want you to calculate the risk, not for the sake of risk, they want to calculate so they know that you have enough capital. So they want to see whether you have enough, we have incorporated all those risks in your capital. So they have what we call a standard approach and we called internal model. Internal model is actually like the, what we did before distributions. However, they take 99%. Now the standard models, this positions, which I told you, they give you percentage. They tell you what is your position, like what we did here and multiply by the position. You don't have to do anything very straightforward. Um, this is for equities and for fixed income and for foreign exchange. Uh, for um, for this one, um, uh, when we talk the internal model, which means now you have to look, you have to make all this distribution, and then when you do the distributions, you have to to take ninety nine percent of the adverse move. So instead of ninety five percent, you take uh, you know uh, ninety nine percent, which is three standard deviation. Um, that's all actually. Um, just before I finish, please don't worry about the regulatory models. We'll talk about it when we come to capital risk and this is just for, uh, for your understanding. So this one is actually not included in, in the future test. Okay, um, let me finish now. I think I am done. And this is actually the summary and this is the end of part two. Thank you and let me just uh, stop the sharing and say, um, thank you very much. We will, we will discuss all those issues in the tutorial and hopefully in the workshop. Bye-bye and thank you.